In this lecture, we will discuss statistical inference on a mean through hypothesis tests. Let's look at the agenda. Let's take a look at the agenda for this lecture. We will cover statistical inference, hypothesis tests, hypothesis tests for a mean. Let's start with some definitions. Initially, one summarizes data through the use of numerical and or graphical summaries. These are fine to give us a snapshot of what is happening with the data set that we have on hand. The problem is that we don't know what might happen in the future. We can get an idea about this by making inference. Inference is defined as the act or process of deriving logical conclusions from premises known or assumed to be true. It is also considered the act of reasoning from factual knowledge or evidence. Inferential statistics is used to draw inferences about a process or population being studied by modeling patterns in the data in a way that, that can account for randomness and uncertainty in the observations. Here is a roadmap on things that you should be thinking about. What do we want to know? What tool or technique will get us this information? What data do we need? How are we going to collect said data? How confident are you with these results? Now let's review a few more definitions. A population is every data point that has ever been or ever will be generated from a given characteristic. A sample is a portion or subset of said population, either at a given time or over a period of time. And finally, an observation is an individual measurement taken from the sample and or population. There are really two main types of statistical inference. First, there are confidence intervals. These are intervals that allow us to add some confidence to an estimate. For example, I am 95% confident that the true mean is between 4 and 8. The second method is through hypothesis testing. We will focus on this for the remainder of the lecture. For almost all problems that we deal with in statistics, especially with statistical inference, it is critical to be able to translate between the real world and the statistical technique. First, we need to define the question in the context of the situation or the real world. Then we translate that to the statistical question. We then use the statistical technique of choice to come up with the statistical answer. Then finally, translate this back to the real world. Let's look at an example. The assumption has been made that on average, college students spend 17 hours per week on homework. Now we want to test this theory. So what's the real world question? What's the statistical question? For the real world question, we would like to know if college students spend on average 17 hours per week on homework. Now we translate this to the statistical world. Since we are talking about the number of hours on average, our parameter in question is the mean. We would like to test to see if the mean is 17, so our assumption becomes mu equal to 17. So now the question becomes how do we test this assumption? A statistical hypothesis in a, is an assertion or a conjecture concerning one or more populations. You are basically stating some idea that you think is fact. You are not sure if this idea is true or not, so you would like to find out. The objective is to decide based on the sample information which of the two is correct. The process in many ways is similar to a jury trial in the U.S. The defendant is considered innocent until there is enough evidence presented to conclude guilt. The jury actually doesn't know for sure whether the defendant is guilty or not. They can only use the evidence presented. Also, notice that the jury does not find innocence. It is either guilty or not guilty. For a hypothesis test, we assume that the null is true until we can prove that it isn't. The only conclusion that can be drawn is either to reject or not reject. We will never accept the assumption as fact. This can only occur if we have the entire population. Well, we will accomplish this by collecting data and then using a probability. This is the probability that we will make the wrong decision. The decision not to reject does not imply acceptance, only that there is insufficient evidence to reject it. Rejection means that there is a small probability of, obtain of obtaining the sample information that we observed when in fact the hypothesis is true. Now let's flesh this out 
with the homework example. We will first assume that the assumption of the mean equal to 17 is correct. Next, we will collect data on the amount of time spent on homework from a sample of college students. Finally, based on the data that we collected, we will determine the probability that we would have observed the sample data that we did, given that the assumption is true. If this probability is small, then we will conclude that the assumption is false. Let's look at some details. If we reject a hypothesis, it is basically ruled out as a possibility. On the other hand, failing to reject the hypothesis does not rule out other possibilities. Because we can never conclude equality from a hypothesis test, a firm conclusion is established only when a rejection occurs. If we reject a hypothesis, it is basically ruled out as a possibility. On the other hand, failing to reject the hypothesis does not rule out other possibilities. Because we can never conclude equality from a hypothesis test, a firm conclusion is established only when a rejection occurs. The null hypothesis is one we wish to test. It is always a statement of no difference. It is denoted by H sub zero. The null hypothesis will always be a statement of equality. This is because we cannot prove equality without the population. The alternative hypothesis is the one we would like to conclude with some certainty. It is sometimes referred to as the researcher's hypothesis. It is denoted by either H sub A or H sub 1. It can take on values that are greater than, less than, or not equal to. The first two are considered one-tailed tests since we only care about one direction. The inequality is considered a two-tailed test since we care about both directions. Here is an example for setting up the hypotheses. The supervisor is concerned that the specification is no longer being met. The spec here is equality. Let's set up the null and alternatives for this case. Recall that the null is always equality. We should go to the problem statement to get the alternative. Since the spec is looking for equality, the alternative in this case would be the inequality. Of course, just as in a jury trial, mistakes can be made. Recall that I stated that we needed a small probability in order to reject. Is 0.05 small enough? What about 0.01? We need to have some way to decide what probability is small enough to warrant rejecting the null hypothesis. We will do this taking into account the probability of making an incorrect decision. We have two types of errors that can occur. The first is called a type 1 error, denoted by alpha. This is the error that occurs when we reject the null hypothesis when it is in fact true. This is known as the producer's risk. It comes from the fact that when this error is made, you are rejecting a part that is actually good. The other error is a type two error denoted by beta. This is the error that occurs when you fail to reject a hypothesis that is false. This is considered the consumer's risk. It is the risk of thinking a part is good when it actually isn't. No reasonable test procedure can guarantee complete protection against either a type 1 or a type 2 error. This is the price we pay for using sample data. The probability of making a type 1 error is called the significance level or level of significance of the test. So a test with alpha equal to 0 0.01 is said to have a significance level of 0 0.01. This means that if the null is actually true and the test procedure is used repeatedly on different samples selected from the population or process, in the long run, the null would be incorrectly rejected 1% of the time. We need to decide on values for alpha and beta. A good strategy is to decide on the largest value for alpha that you can live with and try to minimize the beta risk. This can be done by making your sample size as large as possible within reason, of course. We will use a test procedure to run our hypothesis test. A test procedure is a rule based on the sample data to decide on whether or not to reject the null. A test procedure consists of a test statistic and a method to make our decision. This can be done using either the rejection region method or the p-value method. We will create the test statistic based on the sampling distribution of the sample statistic in question. So for a hypothesis test about a mean, we will build the test statistic based on the sampling distribution of x-bar.
The rejection region is the set of all test statistics values for which the null hypothesis would be rejected. The critical value is the last test statistic value for which the null is not rejected. The critical value is based on a type 1 error rate. Reject the null if the test statistic falls within the rejection region. The critical value is determined in the same manner in which we found it when we were talking about confidence intervals. Besides the rejection region method, we could also use the p-value method to make our decision. This is the more popular method, most likely because all statistical packages yield p-values for hypothesis tests. After calculating a test statistic, the question becomes, if the null is true, how likely is it that the test statistic would take on a value at least as extreme as the one that the sample data has provided? If this probability is small, then the test statistic value is quite extreme from what the null suggests in contradictory to the null. On the other hand, if this probability is large, then what was observed is reasonably consistent with the null. But how small is small enough to reject in favor of the alternative? The p-value is the probability assuming HO is true, given the sample data would yield a test statistic at least as extreme as the one you observed in the direction of the alternative. We will reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative if the p-value is less than alpha. Here are the steps one should go through in running a hypothesis test. First, identify the parameter of interest. This could be the mean, proportion, or any other parameter. One would then set the null and alternative hypotheses. The alternative hypothesis should be the hypothesis that you would like to prove with some certainty. Then determine the test statistic and make your decision. Now when you present the results, you should state them in the context of the problem. Now let's take a look at some one sample hypothesis tests for the mean. Suppose that we wish to test a hypothesis that the mean is equal to some standard value. The null hypothesis in this case would be that the mean is equal to this null value. Let's suppose that x is a random variable with unknown mean but known standard deviation. If the data is normal, or if n is large enough, the test statistic to assess the hypothesis on the previous slide is the z-statistic given on the present slide. Here are the alternatives and how to calculate the p-value and build the rejection regions. Here is an example dealing with the response time of a computer system. Since we wish to know if the mean is different from some value, the alternative here will be not equal to. Also, we are given the value for sigma and the sample size is greater than 30. So we can use the z-test. Here are the solutions. Notice that I have presented the output done by hand and also by Minitab. We calculate the z-statistic and compare it to the critical point. Since the absolute value of the z-statistic is greater than the critical point, we reject the null. We also see this from the Minitab output. The p-value is 0.027, which is less than 0.05. This will also lead us to a decision to reject. There is a relationship between hypothesis tests and confidence intervals. Recall that confidence intervals provide a set of values that the parameter could take on with some level of confidence. We can utilize confidence intervals to make decisions about a hypothesis. We will create the interval, and if the hypothesized value is outside of the interval, then we will reject the null hypothesis. The other advantage of a confidence interval in this case is that if we do indeed reject the null, a confidence interval gives us a valid interval of values that the parameter could take on. Let's go back to example three and create a 95% confidence interval and use it to make our decision on the hypothesis in question. Let's go back to example three and create a 95% confidence interval and use it to make our decision on the hypothesis in question. Sometimes the criteria that we saw previously do not hold. If we have a normal distribution without knowing sigma, we will use the t-distribution and the test statistic that you see in the slide, which we call the t-statistic. Here are the alternatives and how we calculate the p-values, and also check the rejection region. Notice that this is the same as what we saw for the z-test, except we're using a t-distribution. Here is an example. Notice that we have a sample size of 15 with a normal distribution. 
Also, we do not have any information about sigma, which means that we should assume that it is unknown. Given the size of the sample and the fact that we don't know sigma, we will use a t-test. To see the solutions for this problem, please check out the file called Viscosity Example for HT for one mean.